Gun Homes, uh, the program from Gun Homes today talking. So, uh, my name is Ben Johnson. I'm an independent game developer here in Brooklyn, and uh, I'm a member of Baby Castles, and I help to organize this series for the for the lab. Uh, Baby Castles is a group that puts together um, arcade galleries. Uh, right now, we've actually got one going on at the Ace Hotel. It's running 24 hours a day for the rest of the month um, at the Ace Hotel. It's free. Uh, it's uh, a collaboration we did with Brian Ma, who is a game developer uh, here in New York. Um, and uh, it's called Art Video Games in China. And it's an exploration of the independent game scene in mainland China. And it's really awesome. And you should totally check it out. Uh, if you're here, uh, it's probably because you're interested in games, and you should know that the Game Innovation Lab is going to be hosting a game jam in about two weeks, uh, designing games for a digitally enhanced ping pong table. So if you want to learn more about ping pong plus plus, uh, <laughs> you, can, uh, you can check out the lab's website, uh, gil.poly.edu, for more details about that. Um, let's see. If you're interested in finding out about more events like this one, such as when Anna and Yoneman are talking, uh, uh, you should uh, come and check out Baby Castles. We're on Facebook, uh, facebook.com slash babycastles. And uh, you can also uh, check out our website. We have a newsletter. You can uh, sign up for it at babycastles.com slash website. Uh, right now, we're fundraising for a new permanent location to host events, uh, all sorts of gallery arcades and talks like this one in New York City. And I'm actually really happy to announce I just learned this less than an hour ago, but we, we have a home now. Uh, we, we're going to have a new space opening up uh, in April, so like right away. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get to the good part, guys. <laughs> okay, so the, the really cool thing about this is that it's actually on 14th Street between 6th and 7th Avenues in Manhattan. So it's really easy to get to. Um, so I, I know we're going to see all of you there. And as long as you're going... Uh, you should become a member of Baby Castles uh, because it gets you into events for cheap or free. Uh, if you know any any event that we have where we have to charge entrance to, um, if you're a member of Baby Castles, which we have a stack of these flyers, these yellow flyers that tell you all about various membership levels and benefits and stuff like that. Um, if you come to a lot of our events, it's probably worth it financially. Um, but uh, even if you don't, uh, we really appreciate your support. We try to do as much as we can to help. Uh, bring New York's various developers together and get everybody talking and sharing and get uh, New York City developers working with artists from all kinds of different disciplines. Um, and uh, this is what makes New York such a great place to make video games if you can somehow manage to afford to stay here. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, in addition to uh, the free and discounted entry to future events, uh, there's also special, uh, special access to members only previews. Um, and uh, we'll totally write your name on our wall as a founding member along with other donors like John Sharp, Tony Pizza, Andy Wallace, Andy, and uh, Zach Gage. Uh, so, having said all of that, uh, allow me to introduce to you the Grandma Moses of computer science, Andy Hall. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm disappointed that they didn't think that they could charge for this talk now. <laughs> I feel like I'm worth it. I don't know. Um, all right, so the topic of the talk today is uh, free falling through the Goldilocks zone, which you might all be wondering what the heck that even means, and I will be getting to that. Um, so first, who am I? I was the lead programmer on Spelunky XBLA, uh, which is now just like Spelunky. Uh, the old one is Spelunky Classic. Um, before that, I was the creator of an interactive children's book called What is Bothering Carl? Uh, and before that, I worked as a wooden toy designer for five years at Melissa and Doug. So, <clears throat> little warning here before I start. I'll be speaking from the viewpoint of a small indie developer. So if you're a large studio, a lot of this might not apply. And the goal that I'm looking towards, right, is to make a high quality, reasonably scoped project with limited resources and a small team. So if you're not doing that, this might not be the talk for you. So what is a Goldilocks zone? So the term Goldilocks zone, right, it actually refers to the narrow range from a star in which life can form. So it's neither too hot nor too cold, it's just right. So what does that mean for tech in games? Well, it's finding the right amount of tech where you can avoid limitations, but you're not bogged down by complexity. So that, that's basically the talk. Um, so Andy, if you want to, no. I'm kidding, no. All right, so let's, let's look into this a little bit more uh, 
detail of like what it looks like in practice. Um, so to illustrate this, imagine you're jumping off a cliff, right? So two little tech, and this is kind of the side that Derek leans towards. Um, you're kind of flying through space with these boulders all around, right? Um, it's fun, it's fast, it's free, it's great for prototyping and learning. Um, but it begins to get really problematic when you start to work on more ambitious projects. Um, there's limitations, so certain possibilities and features don't exist and can't easily be added. Uh, imitation is built in, right, because the tech that you're using was built for specific types of projects. An um, example, this would be like RPG Maker, right? So it's harder to innovate within that framework. Um, and then mitigation, right? You're designing ideas that are weakened and neutered specifically so they can work with this limited tech that you have. Um, so I, I think a, you know the best way to, to see this is with uh, programs like Game Maker, Click and Play, right? They have these weird, weird limitations, like they're too slow, you have object limitations, they're not very portable, they don't have network code. Um, and I actually ran into problems with what is bothering Carl, which was built multimedia fusion, where I couldn't move it to iPad which is where I probably could have actually made money with it. So too much tech, this is me, because this is what I usually do, you're really just floating through syrup. Um, and, and apparently waffles as well. Um, so it's fun learning so much, right? Like the details of the implementation are just so interesting and you get to learn all this stuff. And you can do anything given the right tutorials and enough time, like you can conquer the world, right? And the, the bad thing is, right, is your brain finds all these little new bits of information and super delicious. So it's like channel surfing all the time, but you're not actually getting anywhere. Um, and it's so slow because there's so much to look through, so much to learn, and so much you can like tweak and improve that you never actually make the game, right? So you don't want to be game engine guy. You don't want to be the guy who fools themselves into thinking that the best way to finish your game is to make tools without ever making the game. Um, so much of the talk, right, is going to focus on this because this talk is really for me so that I don't do these things. <laughs> um, so together, Derek and I, right, we found just right tech. So we were making consistent fast project. All the fascination of working came from our project, like figuring out what worked for our project, uh, what decisions we should make. We were exploring that space. We weren't surveying outside of that, looking for new spaces. Um, it's still fun, right? Like, so fun was on all three of these. And if game dev isn't fun for you, you're just doing the wrong thing. So just stop. Um, so, but you also, it frees you to focus on the game. It frees you to implement um, features when you need them. Uh, and the, the real con, right, is it's fickle. It's hard to know when you're at this spot. It's very hard to keep yourself from straying to one side or the other. Um, especially because that spot can change during your project. So Spelunky, I would say, originally started in the right spot with Game Maker, But it quickly went into the too little tech and smashed into a rock, right? So Derek was able to take Game Maker to pretty much new heights with making the original. But there were still forced compromises built into the game where like, there was a frozen zone. So if you were like, too far away from the screen, the object just wouldn't update. It would just float there. So you could stand with a shotgun and shoot bullets like, off the side of the screen and then just walk forward. And there was essentially a wall of shotgun pellets just like, taking out everything in front of you. Um, and so when he was asked to make an HD version for Xbox, like, Game Maker was not going to fly, right? It needed more tech. Unfortunately, we hopped directly into Spelunky Syrup. So we started using the Braid engine, actually. John Blow had uh, given us permission and the source code to use it, and it was way too complicated for us. Um, it, the Braid engine originally was a 3D engine, so we kept having problems. We were trying to implement the collision, and the collision in Braid uses rounded rectangles, and so we were trying to make them regular rectangles. We were setting the corner radius of the blocks to zero, and everything was just like jittering and shaking all around. It was, it was bad. And on top of that, right, we had all the time rewind code. It's in there. And if you don't update it, like stuff gets messed up, and then the game can break. Um, so it was way, way too much tech for what we were trying to do. So starting from scratch, let us build exactly what we needed. Um, now, we did have the advantage of the fact that the original Spelunky, right, we already had it there. So we knew generally what we were looking for in tech for the full version. 
Um, but Splunk and the engine, right, they're heavily integrated. I, the engine, right, it's not very reusable, and it's probably not even considered a game engine. We pretty much just wrote the game. Um, and we were under the impression when we made this decision that XNA was not an option for full XBLA games at the time. I don't think that was actually true. I think we just never asked the right people, because uh, Fez obviously was made in XNA, and it would have probably sped up our dev time. Um, but I do think that there were, we would have run into other problems that you know, I don't know about because we didn't use it. Um, so how do we know that we were in this Goldilocks zone, right? So I, after we switched engine, I was implementing new parts of the game just a bit faster than I was comfortable with. So we would always like, move on to the next feature before I was even sure that the previous feature was like shippable, right? Um, but we were always knew we had enough tech, though, because we felt like we never couldn't do anything either. So we're like racing ahead. But if we had to add something, we could. We could go back and fix it. But we were never, um, we were never bogged down on any one thing, right? So that key identifying point is that you feel like you're going too fast. If you're like, man, we're going to finish this game in a year, you're not. You're not going to finish in a year. But you need to feel like you're going to finish in a year, or else you're going too slow. Um, so we needed that momentum, right? And um, I can only give you guidance to help you know when you're in the right spot for your project. I can't like stand up here and tell you, like, use this program, use this engine. This is exactly what you should do. Um, that's just not realistic. But So I thought I would share some experiences and tips that would maybe help you find this area for your own project. So implement when needed. So we spent oh, so much time, so many months, just messing around with the lighting engine in Splunky. Um, so all the shadow and lighting code. Um, and we ended up tossing a large majority of it for the final game. There are shadows that cast on the back wall in the game. Uh, there is dark levels, and they're lit by lights. But all the normal mapping stuff is like completely out of there. We had like all this complicated rim lighting stuff going on. You kind of see up here like on her hair, where it's like dynamically trying to like find the edges and like highlight things. And it was cool. Like it was really interesting to me because I'm like I love graphics programming, but it like it wasn't helpful for the game. And in the end, it wasn't even the best artistic direction for it. Um, so don't mistake interesting work for productive work. Because I think that's what we were doing at this point in the project. Um, Derek, when we really got rolling, right, Derek would start building the game with like whatever I had done of the engine. So the engine was not nearly complete. But he's just starting the game, right? And he would just be like, hey, I need to add like dizzy birds to the monsters. And I was like, oh, OK, I'll add something for that. And then, hey, I need to be able to attach like border decorations to the tiles. And I was like, oh, I'll add it. So everything was built like as we were making the game. And it was completely terrifying. But if we hadn't been doing that, I don't know if we would have been able to finish the game. Um, so the next tip is, what, is that playing correctly for you? It's not in mine. OK. So um, implement the bare minimum right feature to support the specific thing you're trying to do. Uh, but not too bare. So we <laughs> this is actually pretty embarrassing. The Splunky engine, when we first started, only supported square tiles and sprites, because that was what the original did. We just figured, oh, we can work with that in the other one. And it made a couple of other things a little easier, and we could shortcut some stuff. But we have really quickly found out that was a bad, bad decision. And so we changed it. But there are still some weird parts of the game where like that is, that is still in there. right? So the statues behind um, the idol and the altar in the game are like these giant vertical statues, and they're actually made of like four giant tiles. Because at the time that we put them in the game, like you couldn't make a giant vertical thing. Um, so, and then we had this 3D menu concept, which is in the game, um, where you kind of like fly through the doorway on the main menu. So this is like kind of the original prototype video that I made in After Effects to kind of look at maybe what we were thinking about. And it changed a lot from this. If you've played the game, this will not look familiar at all, actually. Um, but the whole engine was 2D, right? So we have, I, you probably can't read this, and that's probably a good thing. I don't know, maybe you can. Um, but we wrote, I wrote a function called fake3dme, right? And it just basically takes the camera position and just does some hacky math to like make it look like everything is in 3D. But it never, it never actually is, right? There's no, there's no sense of 3D inside the game. Um, and then, of course, I had to write fake un 3 d me because it was messing up some other function in the game. So, but I think the thing to know, right, and I talked to other people at GDC about this, was that 
when you are in college and you learn to program, you learn like very uh, the correct way to do things, right? But the way you get things done is not the correct way all the time. Um, and that balancing that trade off is what it means to be like making a, th a like a real thing instead of like a project. <clears throat> so, oh, and another example, just like with the particle system, I was just make I was designing the particle systems, and like if I needed the particles to move in a way that it couldn't. Currently, I would just add it to the particle system. So the particle system grew based on the needs of the game. I didn't write this all-encompassing particle system to handle anything I might come up with. I literally only added it if I needed it. So always try, right? If there's a dumber or cheaper way to do it, do it first. So the Spelunky level chunks, like the levels are randomly generated, but they're built out of little like rooms um, of tiles. So Derek. I proposed to him at the beginning of the project, this sounded so good to me. I was going to make an editor for him. He could lay out all the little rooms, mark like what the qualities were, and then the engine could mix them all together and make the levels. And Derek said, no, I'll just use ASCII's like, strings. I'll just type it in in Notepad. It's fine. And I was like completely horrified. <laughs> but it ended up working great, because there was no editor to maintain. Um, it wasn't meaningfully slower to edit the levels in Notepad because of the way it was tile-based. Um, and if we had reached the point where like, that was a problem, where we couldn't do something, we would have easily been able to convert over to some sort of editor, but we never had the need to. Um, and I think many of the interactions and kind of oddities of Splunky came out of the fact that we were hacking together the same bits of code to get it to work how we wanted. Um, so that, that's why the parachute actually still opens. Uh, like in the ending, if you beat the game and you have a parachute equipped, it actually goes off because the game is just running the game code at the ending. It just shuts off your controller. Um, it's why the ghost can be killed, right? Um, it's why, you know, well, in the desert intro and ending, when you're walking across the desert, there's, there's just invisible blocks on the ground. So it's not like some special scripted thing. We just have the character walk across the ground. We just made it invisible. Um, and there's these spike balls in the last area of hell. And uh, when they break off, they, they smash through the ground, just like the boulder in the beginning of the game. So basically, when you break a spike ball off of its chain, we just turn the ball into a boulder. That's it. It's like one line of code, and it just works. <laughs> so a little story time. This is back to my toy making days, and it was not this long ago. Um, so I worked with this guy at the Wooden Toy Company, and he was so amazing in the woodshop. Like, he could make any design perfectly. It would have, like, sanded edges, no gaps in between. It looked better than, like, anything you could buy in a store. And he would wrap them. He would sit at his desk and, like, wrap them in bubble wrap all delicately and tape them up and then put them in tissue paper and ship them to China. And, like, you're like, yes, we're going to get this amazing toy out of this, right? But... It wasn't great, because design changes were like a huge pain in the butt for him. Work was so slow and meticulous that he did less revisions. His designs weren't as strong as the other designers, and he got less work done, and he released less toys. Um, and the factories, right, they couldn't make this stuff as well as he could anyway. So we were sending these beautiful pieces of artwork back, and we were getting like Chinese knockoffs back, because that, that's what we were doing. Um, <laughs> But like when I was working there, I mean, I would kind of tape together like prototypes and hot glue them, and they looked horrible, right? They were completely unsafe, and you would never let a child play with them. Um, or we would just send digital design files, right? We wouldn't even send like a physical thing. We'd just send some Illustrator drawings or whatever. So the thing is, it, our products were indistinguishable on the shelves, right? They, they came out, and no one knew the difference between like what was going on behind the scenes there. And I think it's extremely easy for programmers to fall into the same trap where you have like fantastic comments and perfect indentation, right? You have like all these extra features. You can handle every possible special case. Your code is 2% faster than everyone else's, and you have 10% more particles. 10%, right? Sounds pretty good. But the secret is that you are making a product, right? The users don't see how it works. And it's not that difficult for anyone to max out tech on like popular devices like mobile. It's actually beneficial if your game runs on old, crappy, slow PCs. Because as an indie, you want to have as wide an audience as possible to sell copies of your game. 
And you really don't need to worry about wowing people with your tech, right? Because <clears throat> tech really isn't that important anymore. Tons of game engines like Unity and Unreal are easily available. There's no reason to reinvent the wheel. And also, like, the time and resources that are poured into these things have features that are better, more robust than anything you're going to be able to make yourself. Um, and that kind of the example I always think of is like Spielberg, right? When he makes a movie, he might like buy a new camera, but like he's not reinventing it. He's not fiddling with it in the middle of production. Like, oh, maybe we can get the like shutter rate faster or something. Right? It's a non-issue. He's just making the thing. Um, tech takes all this time and time you don't have. Um, and even if you did, right, it's not like you could win the Technical Excellence Award at the IGF. <laughs> because it doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> so Spelunky was nominated for this primarily for the level generation. And I think this is a perfect example of why it got eliminated, actually. The level generation. <laughs> The level generation in Spelunky, right, it's super clever, and it works amazingly well. But it isn't really a technical feat. You could write it in an afternoon, right? It's more of a design achievement. And <clears throat> I then became the judge for the next year, right, because we were nominated. And this is hilarious, because I, the one part of the game that I didn't write was the level generation code. <laughs> and, so, and I think that's probably why we got nominated. Um, so, but being a judge, right, it was impossible because you can't tell who made what. You can't tell what they used from a library. You can't tell what they wrote their own. And what if, and there were instances of this, you have unremarkable games, though, that have these awesome technical features. Are we really going to give an award to basically a glorified tech demo? Um, it isn't really central to making a great game, right? Um, sweet tech is largely a losing battle. So you, you can't compete with this. And the bottleneck isn't tech, right? It's art and content. Like You will not be able to make enough stuff to, to push the computer to the limit. Um, at a AAA studio, right? it's one guy's job to be focused on like an individual technical task. But in an indie development, like you're the director, the producer, like the content maker, the designer. Like You have to be able to move past like stumbling over kind of these small building blocks. And anyway, right, sweet tech does not mean that you're making a good game. So even though Knack probably has like way cooler tech than Super Mario 3D World, I don't think anybody would argue that it's a better game. And John Blow was recently on a podcast, um, and he recently said that he thinks that Counter-Strike is a better game than Battlefield or Call of Duty. And I would agree with that. Um, and in 20 years, right, Battlefield 4 is going to look like Doom looks today. So you're pouring all this energy into something that is gone. Like it's going to wear away. The, the, the tech, the impressing people with tech doesn't last. So the winning strategy, right, is it is possible to make something with almost no tech, right? Spelunky Classic, Hotline Miami, Papers, Please, V, 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 V. I don't know. Uh, so, and as scared as I tend to be, right, about not using enough tech, it, you obviously can get super far with that. And maybe even the tech that we wrote for Spelunky was overkill based on what the game is. But this is a good thing, right? Like, less, uh, it lets people make games, not just computer science nerds. And the more viewpoints is a good thing, right? We want to open it up to people. You have shorter development times, so people are going to be able to make more stuff, and it lessens the risk of any individual project, right? Like, you don't have to sink three, four years into something to make something cool. Um, and it lets you focus more on the game design and the content, which is more where the focus should be. So I've been pretty down on tech, right? In this talk, it seems like, oh, I don't know if we should have invited him for a tech talk. Um, <laughs> But it is important, right? So sometimes it is just critical to the experience and design of the game. Uh, so examples would be the open world streaming in Minecraft or Grand Theft Auto, or the physics in Angry Birds or World of Goo, right? Like, they have to be there. They're central to what the game is. 
But this is where it comes back to like implement it when you need it. Like do it if you need to, but don't do it just because it's cool and interesting. Um, so don't avoid tech, just choose your battles wisely. So in closing, right, if you want to make tech, just make tech. Like I'm not down on that, right? But you should work at a studio that's larger or you should sell your tool to other indies to use. Um, Unity Asset Store is like awesome for this. You can just make some cool tech. You can get totally lost in it. And then you can let other people make cool games with it. And there's no shame in this, right? Because people still have to do this. So if this is what you're into, like go for it. But if you want to make games, like if you want to actually finish games, you want to try to hide the technical work as much as possible so that you can focus on the art, the design, and the meaning of the game. So you don't want to be the guy struggling to implement hair and cloth physics when your game is one 3D model running around a plane in Unity. And like if you look, if you search right online for how to do some like really complicated things, that's what you'll find people are asking. They're like, hey, I pushed my project, like I've got this one model and I, you know, I can't get like the eye tracking to work. And it's like, that's cool, but you're not really making a game at this point. Even if you have a plan, like you need to start putting the actual rules of the game into place first. Um, and just a final thought, right? We, we actually are all free falling right now in orbit through an actual Goldilocks zone in space. <laughs> so, but we're only here for a limited amount of time. So stop wringing your hands over frame rates, complicated shaders, texture quality, and particle counts. Use your time instead to make as many lasting experiences as you can that will move people, that will change people, that will bring them joy. Because the bits of yourself that you manage to leave behind will forever have an infinite resolution in the hearts and minds of those who play your games. Wonderful. OK, let's do this. Hey, everyone. I'm Andy Neal, and I'm a professor here at uh, NYU Poly in the Game Innovation Lab that, wow, can we, uh, do you guys want to try to, is that not working? Okay, sorry. Um, um, I'm going to start off with a little bit of a Q&A with Andy, and uh, then I'll... It's going to get confusing with the Andy. Yeah, we'll and do, the... okay, you just call me Neelan. Okay. Some people call me Neelan. It's weird, but I, I live with it. Um, and then I'll move it to an audience Q&A after I finish my part. So to clarify what I just did during the talk, um, <laughs> The first time I was in hell, in hell in Spelunky, which for those of you who've never played the game is like the secret fifth world, um, I saw those spiky balls, right? And they actually, some of them rotate at a very moderate speed. So I was like, oh, this is not intimidating. They realize that the chain that they're on doesn't actually hurt you. So it's like, oh, this is really not bad. I guess I could just bomb it to make sure that it doesn't hit me. The second it leaves its tether, it turns into a death ball. <laughs> it actually accelerates at a factor of 100 and just stomps you because it is the boulder. That explains yeah. everything. Yeah. Right? So I'd, so I'd struggled to get to hell. It was so hard. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then that happened. So, Well, I know like Colin, who is actually, if you've played Spelunky, uh, is the model for the, uh, the blue guy with the mutton chops. The first time he was playing the game. Who this is? Oh. So he was actually playing the game before it was out. And he was the first player to get to hell that found it on his own. And um, the first time he got there, he went up to one of the damsels to pick it up because, of course, that's what you do, right? But in hell, there are fake damsels that will turn into a succub succubus. Is that the succubi? Suc su something, yes. And will, you know, hit you. And he was down to one life, so he just died. And that was the end. And, it, you know, it takes a long time to be able to get to that point. And you have to have a good run going, so it's, it's pretty heartbreaking. I promised myself that I would not let this devolve into me only talking about my <laughs> failure at this game. <laughs> but uh, fortunately, so, this is, so here's how this game worked for me, right? I watched better players play. And I'm not even talking about YouTube, right? We all have the fortunate situation that we live in New York City. And I just hung out with better players like Doug and uh, Zach Gage, right? Yeah. And they'd play the game, and then they'd be like, oh, no, don't ever, ever get a damsel in hell. Right? <laughs> so I was like, and then they, were, they explained stuff to me, right? So, we, so this word of mouth thing happened. Was that something that you guys anticipated? Was that something that was already, like, part of the original? Um, 
I think it was part of the original in some sense. Um, I think the original had much uh, a much smaller scope of secrets involved in it, so it was pretty easy to spoil yourself on everything quickly. Um, I think the the, the HD version, um, right? It it it's it has a lot more things going on, um, but it was our intention. Um, that it bring back kind of that schoolyard mentality of like, oh, if you do this thing and then this other crazy thing and then you do this and then you can go to a secret world, right? Um, kind of bring back those days on the schoolyard if you, if you don't just spoil yourself. Um, and we wanted it to feel like uh, a, a badge of honor, right? We wanted it to feel like it was a real achievement if you were able to do this. It totally does. And um, really there, there, was, does. there was definitely pull, right, or a bit of uh, tug of war going on when we were originally doing the game on XBLA because what Microsoft thinks of as an achievement, right, is like beating first level or, you know what I mean, like, you found the jump button, hooray. Um, and so we were really pushing to have a lot of the achievements be very, very difficult. Um, they were not too pleased about that. There was an achievement in Braid that was just speed run the game, which I feel was a troll from John Blow. Is that you? Yeah. Know right, because it was like beat level one, beat level two, beat level three, and then they think there were 30 points missing. Right? And he had to come up with 30 points. I do not know what the story <laughs> behind this is, but it was like speed run the game. Yeah. Like, Braid, really? And I've actually seen someone try to dive, do a speed oh, run on stream, and yeah, and it's, yeah. Two thumbs up. But I've never <laughs> seen Braid speedruns. I wonder if they're on that Amazing Games on Quick arc. I th yeah, I think they are, actually. Put that up but again. Yeah, so uh, let's see. Where am I going to go with this? So, it's, so the interesting aspect about your history through your career in gaming that I find is the most parallel to what I experienced is you had a game, it PAX 10 in 2009, that is a children's, like an electronic children's book. Right? Yeah. So this is when I met you, right? Because we had Osmos in PAX 10, and it was like that. I thought at the time this was amazing that we have such a diverse set of games. That said, at the time, the, f the prominent philosophy in game design, at least as far as I remember, was accessibility, right? We always wanted to make everything understandable and like lead people in so that we get like a wider audience and all these things. Um, but since then, it feels that that's, it feels to me like that's changed because I think that same PAX, I met Derek, and I think XBLA Spelunky had just been announced at yeah. that time. And I said to him, oh, what are you going to do to fit into the current <laughs> landscape? And he said, nothing. Pretty much. Yeah, Derek is actually a, a really stubborn guy with stuff like that. I mean, he was very adamant that his vision of the game was a scene all the way through. And I think he was always convinced, right, that the players, uh, the player base would catch up to where he was. Um, right, because he he thinks about games a lot. He he talks about them a lot. Uh, he works on them a lot, and I think he felt like, you know, he started to burn out on the accessible games sooner than everyone else, and kind of moved on to the next thing. Right, he kind of reacted to that, and he was on kind of the front wave of reaction. I think. Um, Do you feel any responsibility for like bringing this on us? And by I say I mean this in a loving sense because I am addicted to Dark Souls two right now. Right. So. Yeah. No. I mean, I I. I think I feel less so, right? But I think Derek probably does feel pretty responsible for it. Um, but I think in a, in a prideful way, right? Like, I think he's pretty pleased that things worked out in, in his favor. Like, um, you know, I, there are a lot of games doing similar things now. Um, and I think uh, people are just fine seeing how much fun it can be, right? To go back to, like, actually having to work for, for stuff in games. Well, it's especially interesting around the time it hits, right? So that around the time, no one has explored this yet. Right? But that said, you guys revived it, for me in, at least. Right? Like I, played, I put maybe like 20 hours into the XBLA version, maybe 10 into the PC version. So I'd never actually seen the ending of the game proper, like the, not even the four, the four level, the four world version. Right. But then when you guys put out the PC version and added this thing, this daily challenge to it, right? so for those of you who are not familiar with this, you can play the game once per day with a seed that generates the exact same world, correct me if I'm wrong on any of this, generates the exact same world for all players so you actually have like a way to compare yourself to others. But the cool thing is you play it once and you, go, you walk away, right? Because the game can be quite addicting, but you don't get to play the daily more than once per day per account. And most people, per account? Right, you could, Are there people I mean, out there? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> do you have multiple accounts? Would you like to <laughs> come no. clean now? Okay. Can also, okay, wait, wait, wait. I do have a P I play it on PlayStation, on PS3, and on PC. Right? Okay. So those are two separate seeds. Right. Of course I do that. 
There's at least one person over here I'm pointing to right now <laughs> who does that as well better than I do, right? So um, that revived the game for me. And since then, I've put about 240 hours into the shared. That might be more than I've played. Games. And I have yet, I've been to the final boss in hell four or five times, and I've been, become typically impatient. I, t I, s I tilt like a yeah. poker player. And I just lose my cool, and it's over. Yeah, because the thing is, he's not actually that hard, right? He, but the thing is, so is I'm told. it is like, <laughs> but it is like the music ramps up, and you're at that, and you get nervous. And I mean, Derek would even talk about that, because I, I said to him the first time, because I'm playtesting the game, and right when you're making a game, right, we've got the debug menu up. We can just hop around and play the boss a million times. doesn't matter. And I was telling Derek, like, this last boss is so easy. Like, he's the hidden boss. I can beat him no problem. And Derek was like, no, but you people will have been playing for 20 to 30 minutes at that point. Everything will be on the line. They're down to their last bit of resources. Like, you can't make it super hard, actually, because they're going to be shaking when they're playing it, right? <laughs> like, you have to account for the fact that they're not going to be, like, you know, at full playing ability at that so point in the game. Interesting. So brilliant. So basically, like your resolve is already shaken. Let's not right. make it possible. Right, yeah, yeah. And Flappy Birds has none of that. <laughs> no, no, no. No forgiveness wow. there. Wow. So what was your pet? Well, so, so you started, you helped from like day one on the expo, like the reboot of this, pretty much, right? And so a little bit. So what happened was is, so we met, I met up with Derek at uh, that PAX because he was speaking about TIG Source, which is his website. And um, he and I had known each other in like junior high, just online, because we were both in the click and play community making games. Um, and so we kept in touch all those years, met up a couple times in person. So we met, we met up like, um, we hung out pretty much that whole PAX, and that's when he told me, oh, I just got this deal to make Spelunky for Xbox. Um, and John had already given him the braid code, and he had already tried to kind of start making it. And he had the mines showing up, and you could kind of jump around, um, but there were bugs, and it didn't feel right, and there was a lot of issues. And um, I think Derek is a good programmer, and he is a good design, but he's a better designer, right? His right. design and his art are his focus. He programs so that he can do the other stuff. Um, he doesn't program because he like loves it so much. And I think he needed someone that could handle like a lot of the more technical aspects of bringing it to Xbox. Um, and when I got on board, like even work on the break code for me, I was like, this is way above like my pay grade, right? Like, I mean, John's John is just so experienced and was using shortcuts and things that I had no idea even how. To read them or how they worked, so it wasn't um, it wasn't worth trying to slog through all that when I was like, okay, if we just build exactly what we need, like we we'll, we can do this, right? Like we can do it. So the interesting thing that I didn't know up to that point is that Derek has an under has an he's an undergrad was an undergrad major that graduated with a CS degree from Berkeley. Yes, and you graduated from Brown. Yes, you're both like I wouldn't say, maybe accomplished is going too far, but illustrators like you're both capable illustrators. Yeah. Um, and yet, so, so the divergence between the two of you s literally seems to be that you do have a love for some of these more detailed technology issues. Yeah, I, I would also good. say, so, so that makes it sound like I'm better than Derek, though, right? Like, you're exactly the same, except no. you like programming. No, 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 no. Like, and I, <laughs> that is not at all. Wow, okay, so sorry. No, 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 I, I just, <laughs> so the thing is, Derek, I mean, Derek is a much more experienced game designer. Um, and his art ability is above mine. Like, I mean, I, ca I can do shippable art, and I did it at the toy company and with Carl, and like the cartoons in the, in the slideshow, I did those. Gorgeous. You're selling yourself short. So, but, but like, I'm not up to Derek's level, right? And I would say that same thing is true with programming. Like, Derek is not quite up to the same level as programming, but that, that's why it worked, right? Like, that's why we made a good team, and it made it very clear, like, who was boss of who in what area when we were talking about the game, too. Well, that's how you credited yourself in the, in the game, right? It's like you're, he's lead programmer, you're additional programming. Is that true? And then you swapped it out for... No, I, 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 I was like lead... But, yeah, I was lead programmer, and he was like a... Uh, yeah. Lead design, additional design. Something like that, yeah. It sounds like... I mean, it's hard... In the, in the way that you talk about programming and technology, it's pretty obvious, to me at least, that those, these things are intricately coupled, and that you can't actually separate them in the way that the programmer wouldn't be part of the design. Right. Yeah, I think, like, I don't really, I mean, I, I know that there are, you know, at game companies, right, like, part of the reason I didn't take a job at a game company right out of college was 
I would have just been doing like tech work, right? It was just like testing, programming, whatever. I, it was not stuff I was actually interested in, right? I wanted to be a part of the process as a whole. Um, my minor, well, it, it's not really a minor, right? Because they don't have those at Brown. Um, the, the, yeah, but I, I kind of sp concentrated uh, in oil painting on the side of doing my CS degree. So I always knew I wanted to do kind of art with programming, and it wasn't like a separable thing for me. I wasn't willing to go work at a bank or whatever. And did, um, you, did you, when you, uh, when you met with Derek, was it, were you also at this, did you have the sense, did he have to convince you that accessibility is, is on the way out, and that we have to go back to making the game like a rough experience that the people have to like fight to get through and feel the sense of achievement like had, did he have did he need any convincing or were you already like yeah i'm done with this so and that's what i've been doing for a while now yeah i mean i think like i think what, what happened was is he convinced me with the original game because i had tried the original spelunky and played it like well first derek sent me like a prototype this is like when he first started and it was literally just like a random field of blocks, and you could jump around, and you had bombs and ropes. That was it. And I was like, mm, "This is odd." Like there was nothing really to do. I was like, "It seems cool. Whatever. Keep working on it." Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's of encouragement. But I didn't, you know. Yeah. So, and then when when the game got more complete, right? I played it, and I played it for a day or two, and I was like, "Ah, eh, it's okay. It's not really my thing." And then, like, I would keep seeing online on the Tig Source forums, oh my gosh, this game's so great, you gotta play it, oh, there's all this hidden stuff, and I'm reading about the stories that happen in the game, and about the stuff you can find, and I'm like, alright, like, I'll give it a go. And then, the next, like, two weeks, were just, like, me playing Spelunky, <laughs> right? And I 100%ed everything, all the challenge rooms, everything in the original, and then, uh, and then I was on board, like, I love the game. And, um, I was actually the original one who, when Derek had mentioned, that he was going to do the XBLA version, um, I was like, "Oh, you, hey, you know, I'm I'm available, right? Like I'm single." <laughs> um, and I had done what is bothering Carl, and it did pretty well critically, but it wasn't making enough money to make a living off of. So it was pretty clear that uh, making interactive children's books, I was if I was going to make enough money at it, I would have to become basically just like a publisher and like get a bunch of books going. Because the one book took like six months or something to make and it was not making that much money. So I was ready to jump on something else and I didn't have a job and my wife was like, mm, why not, right? Like, hey, so support. yeah, so I mean, it, that's how it kind of fell into place. And Derek, I think he was really naive, honestly, in like agreeing to use me because I, I, I hadn't programmed in five years, right? I'd been a toy designer. I made the children's book in multimedia fusion, which is like click and play, basically. It's like advanced click and play. Um, <laughs> so I hadn't done actual programming for five years. I never really worked on a finished shipped game. I'd made games in college. Um, and I think he kind of just put his faith in the fact that he knew I had finished games when we were younger. And he knew I finished Carl. Like, I finished stuff, right? And Derek is big on finishing. That's always, you know, right. he wrote that thing online, too, about, you, you know, finishing is, like, more than half the battle. Right. So it's interesting, right? Because, like, okay, so switching gears a little bit before I move it on to here. Otherwise, I'm, this is, a, so <laughs> my friend Aaron is over there. He's just already looking at me. I'm <laughs> totally doing what I said I wouldn't. I'm already <laughs> hogging the conversation. Um, so this whole IGF tech thing, right? This is a... Uh, we're both partially responsible for the death of that, right? Somewhat. Like, none of us pulled the trigger, but when asked... We weren't defending it, we that's for sure. Yeah, it, exactly. Right? But it comes, it, it's a, it comes at a weird cost. We're at this point right now where everyone, like you brought up UDK and, and Unity and all these things, where we're using these things and we're just, you know, making games that potentially look the same, but I shouldn't be that down on it because people are being very creative in the use of these of these various tools, and yet sometimes I fear that like the innovation has to come again from someone on the ground, right? You said it's hard to innovate because it's more work and you shouldn't be concentrating on your tech. But it's not going to come from academia necessarily, at least not that kind of innovation. And so I usually feel that, for example, because you were saying, oh, tech as in World of Goo or tech as in these other things, um, and similar to you guys, before I was a juror in, on the IGF tech jury, Osmos was nominated for tech. Right, which we also were like, 
<laughs> it's a physics simulator that has like 10 lines of code, which if Eddie is watching this, he's kicking, he's kicking the TV right now or whatever he's watching this on. Because it's not true, it's probably a little bit more complicated than that. But we didn't believe that this was amazing tech. Right. And yet, when I teach my class now, I show the jumping arc of, of Mario and Super Mario Brother as like the ground level amazing technology. Right, that they just figured out how to do good, like explorative and nicely balanced motion with air jump, with jump, jump control, and all this stuff. Where does tech begin and end? Like, how do we, how do we talk? Well, this is the indie tech talk, and yet we don't like, hey, let's all get our laptops out and start writing how to shift operate and blah, 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 right. all that nonsense, right, that you see in maybe John Lowe's code. You're like, oh, he's, the code is super tight. I have no idea what's happening here, right? Right. Right. So, well, I mean, I think the way I look at it, right, is that, see, I, I, I think it does come down to like what your definition, right, of tech is. And I think that jumping in Mario, right, is a good example because once you know the secret, once you know how it's done, you can do it really easily. And I think that's the same with like Splunky's level generation. Like, you know it and you can do it really easily. I think the tech that is not good is the tech that, remains difficult to use even once it's figured out, right? Like, I mean, there's, there's the sense that, like, if even after you've done it, you can't really reproduce it easily. Um, like, you kind of have these base building blocks, you know? It's like a language. Like, those are the basic, like, words of it. But, like, when people think of tech, right, they're talking about, like, volumes that people make, like, oh, and just plug this in and it'll do this amazing thing. Like, more of a black box. Like right, and I think, like, if it's, yeah, I mean, it, it, if it's part of the game, if it's what makes the game what it is, then it's, then it's super important. And you, you do want to spend time on that. And you do want to really um, tweak it. I mean, like, we spent forever on the jumping in Splunky and how it felt and how it ran. But, like, that's not, like, any of you could look at the code when it's done for, like, the movement of the character and understand it perfectly, right? Like, it's not like we're doing some magic that makes it happen. It's just that's the thing that needed a lot of attention. I, I don't know. So I guess I draw the line to like, you know, VR or whatever, right? It's coming. And people are going to do cool stuff with it. But the people who are going to do cool stuff with it are probably not the people who are like making it work right now. The people who are making it work are just building another tool that designers and game makers can use. And if you get too caught up in like figuring all that intricacy out with that like you're not making a product at that point you're like you're in R&D so you're saying that this like the second like it basically at some point moves from being technology to a design to the more to a more design heavy piece of right. the puzzle yeah yeah i would say like if the if the genius of it is in design then I, it's almost not tech. The tech is just implementing that thought, here's right? full disclosure in the year Spelunky was nominated for tech i was on the tech jury Right? And my argument for why it's amazing tech is because it exactly knows where tech ends and design begins. In the sense that I knew that you guys were working with large hand-designed blocks that were then arranged and populated by figuring out that there's a critical path and all these things. Right? I was aware of this, and I thought the genius lied in knowing exactly how far you can take the tech and at which point you need to use the the, the hand of the designer. Right, and I, I guess I would agree with that. Like, I think that's how it should be done. And I think that um, that would be great if that's what that award had meant so, or something. But it, yeah, I don't the, think it did. I think what, what happened was is you have half the people, right, thinking that it's like... Well, I was the only through line for three years, right? And the first year I was in it, it was with Ron Carmel, and we, who was worked on World of Goo, and we had defined it as uh, interesting use of technology in a gameplay setting. Right, so essentially not the glorified tech demo. Right. So in closing, I'll move it over to the audience. Because of the fact that it's this amazing technology for me, right? For me, this is like I still, and I'm a professor of computer science. I think I know a little bit about technology. <laughs> I hope so. Um, how much do you still manage to surprise yourself? Right? How much do you manage to surprise yourself when you, because I'm assuming every now and then you may still play the game. Right. I know I, don't, I, know I still play Osmos once in, every once in a while. Not a lot, but do you manage to still see things where you're like, oh, I just died in a way, and it's, that never happened before? So it, it probably doesn't happen to me 
personally anymore because of the fact that one, I, I don't play the game that much at this point. I've played a lot. And um and it, it's just work like looking at it at this point. It, it doesn't it, um it's not relaxing and fun for me. I know. So I'll never I'll never get to know the joy of just like curling up on the couch with it or whatever. Um but I, but I think the the other issue, right, is or I mean people that I know about all the things that can happen relatively commonly. The things that I hear about are like the really strange bugs that people find or the really bizarre interactions that we didn't know about. Um, and I find out through Twitter. Somebody tweets me like, hey, dude, Splunky's totally broken. Guess what I found? And then it's like, oh, boy, guess what I get to do today? Um, so, like, the biggest one, right, was that people figured out you could use the ball and chain, which you get if you blow up two altars. You make Kali angry. You can actually use the ball and chain to break the Moai head, which is supposed to be, like, this indestructible object in the game because you can get inside of it by breaking it. And normally you have to use a special item to teleport inside. And so it completely broke open, like kind of different paths through the game, the and now famous the eggplant, uh, eggplant run. run, yeah. So, but, eggplant <laughs> but we had no idea. Derek nor I even knew that was possible in the Best game. Best part about that is that the object was still rendered, even though the collision box was gone. Not anymore, though. I know. So which, we updated to include here, that as a tip of the hat, right? So if I if I understand correctly, and I haven't seen this, you updated the sprite. To show a bro so you embraced the fact that this yeah. was a possibility. Well, because we couldn't kill the eggplant run, right? Like it was, it's like Spelunky legend, and like we don't want people to not be able to reproduce it, like in in the, the year twenty X, right? Like, like tremendous happiness that, it, irrespective of your tr attempt to try to make this work, <laughs> it just doesn't. Like yeah, just, I mean, it's like oh, okay. Yeah, we gave in on a lot of that stuff. Like there, there's. I don't even know if I should be talking about some. There's okay. So the Xbox version has had less updating than the rest of the versions. There are some things you can do in that game that I will not speak of that are, I mean, just ridiculous that were never intended. And you know, it it's awesome. Like it, it, the thing is, is that like for the average player playing the game, the game's still fun, right? Like this is like in Mario when you can go to Minus World, right? Like it's a nasty bug. I mean, you're just like basically jumping into some random memory and playing a level. Like, it's not good. But it happens so rarely and specifically that it just becomes part of the lore of the game. And because of the way Spelunky has all these secrets embedded in it, like, it all just blends together. Like, we don't even have to tell people what's a bug and what's not, right? Like, it's... <laughs> um, but, but I think, like, you know, that, and the other one that we did fix, right? So there are ones we fix. Because somebody wrote me and said... Oh, if you have the shield equipped, which is a rare item, you don't have it often, and you get hit by a spike trap in the hell, which getting the shield there requires the same thing the eggplant run does. It's very difficult. The uh, collision of the spike ball will actually like deactivate for your character. It will no longer be able to hit you. It'll just go through you. And so like th that doesn't really add anything to the game. It just looks bad and buggy. So like we took it out. And now the shield just blocks it. So you won't get hit. It'll okay. it'll just block the ball and it'll kind of make a spark and keep spinning. Um so we are we're not just letting everything fly basically. You know, we do we do like take a look at each individual case whether it adds to the game or it subtracts. Okay, I, I have so as much as I'd love to continue and we'll continue this later. <laughs> I'm going to move it to the cuz this is never going to end <laughs> ever. I'm going to move it to the audience. So uh please any any questions yeah. starting with Noah? Do we have, wait, we have a mic, because we're, we're, this is actually streaming right now. I'd like you on the stream. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, so you guys talked about Splunky as like a response to kind of casual, accessible uh, world that kind of came before and used Dark Souls as, as an example of, I don't know, another kind of non-accessible game. <laughs> But something I've been thinking about a lot recently is that like Splunky is actually super accessible in some really interesting ways. Like every a lot of everything like is what it looks like. Like the spikes will kill you. Falling for like longer than a visible screen height will do damage. Like bombs blow things up. Uh, there's you know the matic matic break stuff. It's not like Dark Souls where like this is a bug. I don't know what it. Sorry, I mean this is an insect. I don't know what it's going to do to me. <laughs> or like this is an item that has a description that's extremely like obscure and weird. So. Yes, the game is hard, and yes, like you'll die a lot, and you need to do a lot of learning to play it. But 
I, just, I guess, and I know you're probably not the right person to ask because the uh, Splunky Classic came into existence uh, before you were working on the project, but like how much, was there a lot of iteration in like that kind of stuff? Like the climbing glove being a hand, like that just makes sense, but was, it, was there ever a point at which things weren't as obvious on the surface, I guess? Um, I guess I can only speak to like the newer stuff that I added, but I'm sure like, so when working on the game, like Derek was definitely always talking about making things very clear in kind of what they did. Like we, were, we weren't trying to trick the player with the exception of stuff at the end of the very end of the game. Um, it was meant to be, you know, these are some objects in a world, experiment with them, see what the advantages and disadvantages of them are. Um, and, you know, a big driving guideline with the new items, right, like the boomerang and the freeze ray, was that they were self-explanatory in what they did, right? When you find a freeze ray, like, you expect it to freeze stuff. And then the interesting things that come out of that are like, oh, if I freeze something underwater, it floats. If I freeze something in the air, it falls and breaks. But those are, like, kind of obvious when looked at in retrospect. But when you first pick up a freeze gun, you don't know it does that. But you're not surprised that it, it does it. Um, so I think that kind of internal logic was very important, like working on the game. And we did work to not have anything that was super obtuse, but I don't know of anything. Well, I, I guess the closest thing I can say is like we did take out <clears throat> like the bow and arrow from Splunky Classic because it added like all this extra stuff to the game that just like you wouldn't know about or even care about. Like, now suddenly, like you could pick up arrows, right, from arrow traps, and then you could shoot them with your bow. And then there was like this thing where you could put a bomb on a bow and shoot it, but you had to have this separate thing in the HUD for the arrows. And it just added like an entire layer to the game that doesn't exist outside of that item. So the goal was to have every item work the same as every other item. Um, because there was enough going on that any individual piece could remain like pretty simple and self-explanatory. I don't, I don't know if that, does that answer? I, I kind of just talked about it, I couldn't really answer anything. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, that, that's kind of what I expected, <laughs> so that's cool. Okay. Uh, it's just a different kind of accessibility, and I guess in a game like Splunky, where the interest comes from like different parts moving together, rather than Dark Souls, which is like a totally composed experience, right. the parts yeah. have to make a lot more sense. Yeah. Good point. Now it's, uh, throwing Dark Souls and Splunky into the same pot of inaccessibility is definitely, I, I'll take that on myself. That was a <laughs> wrong, wrong thing to do. <laughs> All right. Um, Else? Over here, move the mic. No, it's okay. <laughs> I'll take it. So, when you threw out the engine and the in progress version that Derek had, and you switched to doing it yourself, did you ever think at any point, oh my god, this was a horrible mistake. We should have kept the old engine. I can't believe I have to like worry about drawing stuff and particles. And yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I made it sound like it was like magical Christmas land as soon as we moved over. Um, it really wasn't. I think the first time that I was like, uh-oh, this is, could be bad, was we got the new engine kind of up and running, and then we ran it on an Xbox dev kit for the first time. And like it's so this is it's working like basically all it was was like Spelunky guy and like some blocks and you could jump around in like one level and you couldn't leave there were no doors there was nothing um, and we're like sweet this is great it runs at like 120 frames a second on my laptop great let's put this on the Xbox and it ran at like three frames a second and it was at that point where I was like oh, oh no like what <laughs> what have we done like if I can't even get one sprite jumping around a room running past three frames a second on Xbox, like, this is going to be bad. Um, and yeah, you, get, you get past it, right? Like, the, the answer to that was we were making lots of dumb decisions, right? Like, I was introduced as the Grandma Moses of, of programming. And I don't know if you know who Grandma Moses is, right? But she's this lady who, like, lived out in the woods. And she was elderly, and she, like, taught herself to paint, kind of has this completely unique style, and ended up becoming, like, a big success in the art world, like, out of nowhere. And the thing is, is I hadn't programmed in five years since college. Like, I didn't really know how any of this stuff worked. And so I was just making fundamental, like, mistakes. Like, just dumb mistakes that even, like, anyone who'd worked on an Xbox game for a month would know not to do. And that was what was slowing it down so much, right? So it looked scarier than it was. Like, the problem looked way worse than it was. 
Um, and then the only other times where it was like, oh, geez, this is really bad, was like when we were implementing like the Xbox specific like signing out of the account and like resetting the leaderboard, all this stuff that's like, you know, the, the TCRs, where it's just very technical, like hairy work that is boring. And you're like, man, if we had used the Braid engine, I wouldn't have to do any of this. Um, the same thing with like the text rendering. It was like, okay, I get to write, write all this text spacing code. And, you know, it's boring and it's awful, but, um, you know, it, the, the, the choices were to write that bit myself or like import this giant thing that we had no control over into the project. So, uh, right here. It's coming. I have a complaint. <laughs> so, um, I play Spelunky exclusively on my PlayStation Vita. I use my Vita exclusively for Spelunky. <laughs> uh, the HUD has burned into my screen. I was wondering if the Pro update is going to come to... It's a shitty question, I'm sorry. But is, is the Pro update going to come to the Vita? Uh... It's looking like that. I can't. I won't say one hundred percent for sure, but we're. I think. I think it will be. Yeah. So I, I didn't. No, I don't know when. But like, basically, the the Vita port is uh, another company took care of that, and uh, like they have the stuff to do it. But I don't really know like what's going on up to date with it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, for, yeah, right there. Yeah. Yep. I'll get to you in a second. So um, earlier you had mentioned. Um, that game developers should try to stay in, um, I forgot the term, Goldilocks. Uh, yeah, Goldilocks zone. Uh, zone, Goldilocks zone. Yeah. And um, you mentioned how there has to be a balance between, you know, um, the, the tech that's involved in designing a game and then the actual um, design and interesting aspects of a game. And um, a, two, few, two examples that I could think of that, I mean, have stood out to me when you were talking about that were like um this the metal the newest like metal gear um that's being released that was like being um an expected runtime of like three to five hours or something and they were charging like full price and that was like a big issue that oh this is like so great looking but you know the actual gameplay itself isn't all that it's like a it was like glorified dlc that was literally like what like the uh, game mag like um, media was uh, saying it it was that they were trying to sell to the public, and then there was another um, game that was recently uh, released where uh, the director I think it was the director but the game was uh, uh, Castlevania Lords of Shadow two, and I think he went on I don't know if it's on record but he was certainly quoted that. Like, he didn't understand why that game was getting ratings like 65% at, like, sites like Metacritic when, you know, oh, like, all this tech that went into it and, like, all these designs and artwork, it's so, like, pretty. Like, why isn't, like, the, why aren't the users seeing that end of this, you know, why, right. isn't, are, why isn't that being looked at as, like, making this game great? So when you mention, um, you know, being stuck in this, Goldilocks zone is that something that um, consume uh, cons like cus customers like uh, game players have to um, kind of speak out about to studios saying like you know we're we're not willing to pay for you know less than stellar games if right we're at these high price marks yeah no I mean I think the the thing is is that um, I think what people could do right is just let Game companies know. I mean, I, I on bulletin boards, like, or like on the internet, I guess, or like through sales. But is that you know you don't value say story more than gameplay. You don't value great looking graphics more than gameplay. Because um, I think that that's what it like fundamentally comes down to is that you're setting these bars for the the kind of side things about the game, right? Like you can have a great game with terrible graphics and it's still fun to play. But if you have a terrible game with great graphics, like you don't no one's going to want to spend time with it, right? And so like the priorities are, I think are wrong on a lot of these projects. And so that would be what I would tell those companies, I guess, or like people that 
are making these games and wondering like what's the problem is that the gameplay, the game design, that's what that's what people are actually there for. The rest of it is just there to make that look good um, and to present that clearly and well to the user. Um, so I think like that's where the shift has to be. But like the problem is, right, is that the people investing in the games, the people financing this stuff, like with some exceptions, of course, but like most of them don't play games. A lot of them don't. And so what do you see? They see the graphics, right? Put up the slides, like, hey, look at this. And it, oh, it looks like a movie. Great, fund it, right? But then, oh, this game's really fun to play. Let me show it to you. Like, let me let me pull out like my computer and oh, it's just blocks moving around. It doesn't matter how fun it is. You can't you can't sell that, right? You can't make money to make that. So, I, I think that that's where the, it comes down to is like it has to come like the more of the resources have to go into the game, less into that extra stuff. Right behind you. Uh, this idea that you shouldn't focus so much on the tech or just in time and not having a fetish for your, your engine, I think is a particularly mature position to get at as a programmer. Like it takes a couple, it takes a lot of experience to I think get to that point. Right. And uh, was this something that you've always had or was there something, an event that happened to you in your career that kind of made you realize this or how did you get to the point? So um, I would say that, <clears throat> Hmm. So I guess I start. I should say I started making games in Click and Play, and my original like forays into it were, were making tech. Now, like we're talking really low tech, right? But it's like, ooh, let's see if we can simulate Mode Seven in Click and Play, or like I wonder if we can do full screen scrolling. And so I would spend like hours and hours and hours making these like demos. But I never put out games, right? And I would see on the message boards like other people getting like oh, your game's so awesome, and I would look at the games, I would look at them, and I would say, I could do that, I could make that in a week, this is so dumb, why are they getting popular, right? I'm awesome, I know all this stuff, I can figure out how to make that, but like, double the resolution. And it, the thing is, is that it didn't, like, that experience of being left out, and then looking in and saying, like, what are they doing differently, what are they doing differently? And it always came back to, to finishing the game, they're making fun games. Like, the reason I like games is because of the characters in them, because of the fun things I can do in them. And, um, and then when I started on Spelunky, I think I kind of slid back a little bit, right? Like I was very concerned, like so many people are gonna see this, I have to impress people. This is like my one game I worked on, like if I don't impress people with the sweet lighting engine in this game, people are gonna think that I'm a hack. <laughs> and well, you giggle, but it like went through my head, right? Like I, it just kept me up. And, um, and I think, it, you know, when I, I had a friend who was actually the lead programmer on uh, Brutal Legend, you know, and I met up with him at GDC and talked to him, and he was like, dude, like, the, believe some of the code that goes into games that ship, right? Like, you wouldn't believe at the hacks and the workarounds and the stuff that just gets it done. And, um, you know, I think when you start valuing the final product and the art over the craft, like, you'll start just shifting your view automatically. Right, like that's when the change occurs. Is when you see yourself not finishing stuff. You see yourself not getting your vision out there, and other people are like, "Bam, bam! Oh, I put three games out this year," and you're just like, "Oh my goodness!" Um, so it's kind of that envy of other people kind of made me switch sides. Um, and, but I still fight against it, right? Like I'm working on a project now, and I'll be lying if I say I don't get lost on forums reading about some like sweet thing I could add to the game. And it's just like, I have to put that aside and be like, no, I'm not going to work on that right now. Interesting. Uh, Josh? Uh, two questions. One is, if, if you were to do it again um, now, would you use an engine uh, like Unity, like you mentioned, or something? Um, and the other is, are, was there any libraries um, or uh, middleware that you used? Um, well, I'll answer the first one, or the second one first, because it's pretty easy. So, I mean, we just used Direct3D, uh, FMOD for sound, and like X input or whatever for the, for the controllers. Uh, and then the, uh, the uh, Xbox libraries for all that stuff. But that, that was it, basically. Um, in terms of if we would have used the engine now, I, I think I would be more inclined to. I'm definitely still suspicious of engines. Like, it's probably the best way to put it. Um, but certain things in the game, I would have liked to have been able to just plug something in um, and not worried about it because they ended up only having to be serviceable. Um, 
And I think that's an important distinction to make, right? Is like, you don't have to make every part of your game like super special and unique. You just pick the points at where you're going to dump that effort into. And so, you know, like if we had used some like middleware, like text rendering software, like no one would have cared. Like there's nothing I'm doing that's so awesome in there that like couldn't have been replicated. Um, and so, yeah, that's the kind of stuff I would have looked to have done. I think it would have been a little scary to go like whole hog and like jump into something like XNA. Um, but like I said, it probably would have sped us up. I just don't think I have it in me to go that far. I'm not, I'm not at that step yet. <laughs> right here. I noticed uh, you were talking earlier about in your drawing analogs between your experience as a toy maker and then also your experience as a game maker. And I think you used the example of it was like the, the person that is observing the finished product is not concerned with the process. That was an example you gave. Yeah. And you use the anecdote of the toys and sending them to China. And I think you, I can't remember the example you used when you were doing the games, but basically the same idea. Um, I was wondering if you could give another observation regarding your work as a toy maker that also applies to making games, like something that you can just think of off the top of your head. Well, this, is, uh, this shouldn't be too difficult, because I actually, gave, at GDC last year, I gave a talk specifically on this topic. Um, but I would say that, um, you know, the, the one that jumps to mind the most is, um, like, in, so in toy design, it costs a lot of money to add anything to the product, right? Like you know, oh, if we add like another wood piece, that's X amount of cents on the cost of the product. And so you learn to be very economical with your choices and like what you're adding to the product, how things work <laughs> together. You're looking to get like maximal interaction out of a minimal number of pieces. And I think on computers, right, we tend to think, oh, this stuff is free. I can make like 50 different guns for my game. And the fact is, it's like, no, each of those is another set, that that's money that you, are losing for other parts of your game, right? That's time you're losing for other parts of your game. So I think that mindset, right, of every choice I make has like more implications than just the thing I'm putting in the game. It has effects on you know how it interacts with other things. It has effects on what I'm going to be able to spend time on later. Um, like with the bow and arrow you mentioned earlier. Right, and so that kind of thing, right, is like. Um, <clears throat> It was useful, and then I guess this goes back to Aaron's question a little bit, right? It's like working as a toy designer, the product cycles are like much shorter, right? So I would get to go through this process like over and over and over again, like during the year, like six times a year, eight times a year. And you really get used to this idea of like finding the fun, cutting the other stuff, polishing it, refining it, and putting it out, and then seeing how it does. And like you get, you see that cycle over and over and over again, and then you realize games are the same thing, right? It's just longer, and the money's not coming like directly out of your pocket. It's coming out of your future pocket, but you don't realize it when you're doing it. Thank you. There was another one over here. Uh, no? Oh, that was, okay. Oh, sure. Let's get it back, wait, it's all the way, all the way over there. <laughs> On the far end of this gigantic room. Uh, is someone who, who's a really big fan of, of roguelikes and procedural death labyrinths or whatever uh, the, the current <laughs> phrase is. I, I have to say this Splunky is maybe one of the most successful uh, procedural level generations game, or games I've played. Do you have any insights into kind of like the balance between like a uh, handcrafted content and kind of randomization to actually make for like good play or gameplay experiences? Um, I think the thing you want to go on is, um, I, I think the thing that works for me so on Splunky with it is that things are recognizable. Um, I, I don't know if that's, um, the greatest thing to say. <laughs> so it's this sense of like, you're in this random place, you know that there's going to be just blocks everywhere, but we do have a lot of stuff in Splunky that prevents it from generating things that look generated, um, which includes like having diagonal gaps, like so having two blocks and then diagonal gaps on each side, like it just looks weird, like it doesn't look like it could have naturally formed, 
So like that can happen with the generation. We actually do a pass over the whole level to try to straighten those all out just to make it look a little bit more solid. Um, and then it's like those landmarks, like the shop, the snake pit, the altar, the idol. Like you come into areas that feel real, which in turn makes like this random hallway that you generated more believable. Whereas like if it was just endless stretches of that, like you never get a sense that this is a real place. I mean, you don't think it's a real place, but like you don't get a sense of place at all, right? You just get a sense of like I'm wandering through random corridors. But as soon as there's like a location at the end of it and there's another location and you can like place, build a map in your head of the space, you stop noticing it. And I guess like, I would say it's similar to like Grand Theft Auto's map where like there's hot spots like you know where like this gas station is or whatever and this diner and like there are buildings in the middle. They're just there to like kind of look the part, right? They don't do anything. They're not part of the world the game world, really, they're just walls. But because there's enough believable stuff plopped around, they just blend in with the scenery. So I think that's what you want to hide your randomness, like in that space of like, you drive by and you never notice. Uh, and then the part that people remember are the parts that you build yourself. I don't, you're not going to get around that, I don't think. Thank you. Back here. Another another distant trip. <laughs> so um, I was wondering about your thought on the Goldilocks zone as pertains to <clears throat> if you're working with someone who wouldn't be like Derek, in that they have programming backgrounds. Like, how do you have you thought about approaching it where someone you'd be collaborating with has like little to no programming experience? How that would shift the balance. Oh, oh, so if the person you're working with doesn't have any tech background, basically. Um, I mean, I think like you'll end up doing more of the tech work yourself, obviously, and they're going to do more of the other stuff. Um, but I, I don't think that necessarily changes um, your role other than, I, I guess tools might start to be something that you would think about doing more so. Um, if they really can't interact with the game without that at all. But at the same time, like, I would encourage people to find other tools that <laughs> exist already and use those as the bridge between the two. Um, because there is, like, there is so much work that goes into making a game. Like, it's, um, I, I mean, it's almost, like, I was getting ready for this talk, I was, like, opening old versions of Spelunky. Blowing my mind the amount of work that we did like to get from there to there, right? And if you think you're going to do that in any reasonable amount of time and also support a tool chain for some artist or some level, design, it's just not going to happen. Like, so if you have enough people that you can have like tool guy, game guy, and art guy, like cool, like maybe that'll work, right? But there, if you're like all hands on deck, like you, I mean, you just, it, it'll take you five, six years to make a game, right? Like, and you can do it. I mean, it's certainly possible. It's just a much, much more difficult process. Um, because I think, you know, we were done Spelunky like a year before we were done. I mean, the game was playable. We could give it to our friends. They could play. It was cool. But like, it, it wasn't a product for another year um, because of all the Xbox stuff. And, um, and so I think that that's why I, I, I want to emphasize like that free falling part, right? Like you have to feel like you are flying through this thing. Like you can't believe how much work you did in the last week. But that's every week. Like it's got to be like that, um, because I, you just—I mean, it's not like the business world where you have like a team working on six months on like a module that people will use. It just—it's not—it's not how it operates. Um, and that—that's the benefit too, right? Because you have total control. You can make whatever you want. Like that's the reason to be like independent. That's the reason to make smaller projects. Um, but I think uh, even the smallest like extra bit of work is just bigger than you think. I, I, there's no other way to put it other than like, you'll be surprised at how much you underestimate everything. <laughs> I think there was another one over here, right? So is it true that the levels are ASCII files? They are. I mean, they're just strings. Like Derek would just send me a notepad, and I would just be like, all right. And you're just... loading the notepad in? No, I'm just pasting in the source. <laughs> <laughs> That's even better. Yeah, so it's just like, well, 
guys who in Spain who were like um, porting the game to PlayStation. They said like they were like looking for the source the first time, and they came to the level generation code, and like they started cheering in the office, because like. <laughs> They are all from like the demo scene originally, oh, wow. okay. and so they're like, "All right, like this is our kind of stuff." And and I think also like it was just like sweet, like we don't have to work with any busted tools that they try to make. Like everything is just on the screen, right? It's just like yeah, just like change the letters, change the level. Like it's not so they. I mean, it's you know you can just look at it as a human and read it, and there's a huge benefit to that. Um, I remember actually like we put Splunky out on PC, and I got so many emails from people. Saying like, thank you so much for making the config file for the game human readable. Like, <laughs> when did they not become human readable? Like, why would they not be? It seems weird to me. Like, I was like, why can't I just open a file and type in the resolution under the part where it says resolution, right? Like, it just seems like that should just work. And but I think people were shocked that it's just like, yeah, it's that simple. Like, that's all you have to do. Okay, right here. Um, you said. About all the like the blood, sweat, and tears, and all the time and effort that you put into Spelunky, and you know now that you've done it, like the game is out, everybody loves it. It has a base. Would you ever consider making DLC or like a Spelunky two ever? Um, I could say flat out, like we're probably not going to do any DLC. Um, I think Derek and I both feel like okay, this is like a complete work. Um. And we don't just want to throw stuff in to throw stuff in because everything was so carefully thought out. It would just it would be a lot trickier than it sounds to just add some more items, let's say. Um, and I think we're happy with where the game is. Um, I think you know we're so Derek and I are not working together on our next thing, but not because we didn't get along. We actually had a really great um, relationship working, um, but we both kind of want to do our own little prototypes and projects on the side for a little bit. Um, and after we do that for a couple years, like I think we may come back together. And I don't know what the thing we would work on would be. Maybe it would be Splunky 2. Maybe it would be something completely different. Um, but I would say, yeah, we're definitely going to do something else. And I would be surprised if it doesn't have any Splunky DNA in it, right? I, I would be shocked if it, didn't be, if it wasn't influenced by that. But I, there's no plans for any sort of direct um, follow-up. If that, but you know, if that's what people are hoping for, unfortunately, I feel the game is pretty much a piece of art, <laughs> a complete piece of art. If I've ever seen one, I mean, like, yeah, I, I, I'm still gonna play it for a long time. I've yet to beat hell, so figure, <laughs> I'll figure I'll get to it at some point. That's it. Thanks a lot. It was amazing. Yeah. Do I, do I just turn it to zero? Oh, up there.